Courtney. Why don't we just pray to start with. Father, we're just grateful again for this day. Pray that your word would be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Turn to uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. We won't read a whole lot of verses from there. You know, in this assembly, prior to this week, that I call Song of Solomon Dave Wright's book, because he, he reads from that quite a bit. Uh, and it just so happens that this week, not the past that I'm reading, but uh, actually Matt Hebert was uh, shared a few things from the Song of Solomon, which I'm not going to read those either, but we're going we're gonna to start right at the beginning. Um, I don't know if yours has a title. Uh, mine says, The Young Shulamite Bride in Jerusalem's Daughters. It says, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, May He Kiss Me with the Kisses of His Mouth. Wow, sounds good. You're talking about your wife. For your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is, it should be poured out oil or poured forth oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will rejoice in you and be glad. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. That's all we'll read for now. It's interesting that uh, Shulamite bride is kind of a mystery. But if you actually check the Hebrew name for Solomon, it's Shalomo, and Shulamite is just the feminine equivalent, which actually makes sense. You know, I'm going to have a tough time standing behind this podium because I usually move around. But um, when you consider the first man and woman, now I, I don't think it was by accident that Ron brought up Adam this morning and you know the first man adam wasn't even his name adam means man i mean there's two words for man that are primarily used in the hebrew right ish and adam all right it just kind of means that the red from the ruddish of the soil all right so you but you've got adam and uh and now adam is created. Thanks, Scott. And he looks all around and with all the animals and stuff, and there's no one for him. How's that? I don't know how to pull it out. At the bottom? Uh, oh, well, here, I'll get away from it. All right. But, you know, Adam, here he was, he's all alone, and the Lord takes a rib from him and makes Eve Hava, all right? Her name was Hava, all right? Life giver. And we know from our technology now, right? That if he takes a rib and makes Eve, what DNA does she have? Yeah. yeah, she has his exact DNA, except feminine. So you have this similarity here between the Shulamite bride and Solomon, very similar. And actually, whenever you look at the name, all right, for the Shulamite, all right? They, they've never discovered a city, Shulam. There was Shunam, but not Shulam. And a lot of people think that because of the name and because of Solomon's name, because the name comes from, right? If I said to you, Shalom in Hebrew, what does that mean? Peace, Peace right? Peace, safety, all right? So, Shulamo, peace, Shulamite, peace, peaceful. 
And actually, whenever you look at a lot of the Judaism, and, and I hope you appreciate this because we believe in the God of the Jews. It's just the Jews don't recognize Christ as being God and don't accept him as their Messiah. But take heart, they're going to. All right. And when they do, every single one is going to believe. Every one, every one, just like when they came out of Egypt. All right. That's remember, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. It's always a pattern. People say that so much percentage of the Bible is prophecy. You know how much I think of the Bible's prophecy? 100%. Because the patterns all point to the future. Every single one. And they'll point you to Christ because he is our future and our life is hid with Christ. So when you have the Shulamite bride, she's a woman of Jerusalem. Another meaning, according to Jews, for her and for her name is perfection or without spot. Interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we as Christians are known as the bride of Christ. All right. And I like interacting. All right. I, I think it keeps everybody engaged. In the Bible, are we called the bride of Christ? Show me. <laughs> it's not in there. We're called the body of Christ. Where it says husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, right? Now I'm challenging you because I want you to know all right. Next question. Are we the bride of Christ? Yes, we are. All right. Remember, Clay had a whole series on John 14. Remember that? Yes. And, you know, Clay is very good at piecing together lots of scripture. Like when you hear him talk, he puts scripture after scripture and you just go, okay, cool. I've got it. But whenever you read John 14, it's about the wedding. It's about, he says, look, and I'll paraphrase. He says, look, let not your hearts be troubled. And actually this is word for word. You believe in God, believe also in me, right? In my father's house are many, in the King James, it says mansions. It might be rooms. It might be other occupancies. If it weren't so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also, all right? Sorry for the King James, it's, if it offends you, but when, when I grew up, that was all they had, and, and we were forced to memorize scripture, for which I'm thankful now. All right. That is a picture of the wedding. The man would offer to his wife a ketubah in the Jewish system. It was all the promises that he made. And if you have your Bible and you raise it up, that's your ketubah. That is your promise from the Lord of everything that he is promising you for the future. And if she said yes, and by the way, I've, I've reminded you of this, whenever you take this cup of communion, it's the third cup of the Passover. It also is a reminder of the cup that was offered to the bride. When she was proposed to, she got the whole ball of wax, what the promise is, but she could say yes or no. It wasn't an arranged marriage where she doesn't have a choice. She had a choice, just like you and I have a choice. You can either say yes to Christ or no. It's one or the other. So that when she was offered a cup of wine, you know how she said yes? She drank it. She drank it. And in drinking the cup, the cup of redemption, and it speaks of the bridal ceremony, 
that now she is bound to him, even though they're not officially married yet, they haven't come together yet, but they are betrothed to one another, and she is to stay faithful to him and him alone. So she says, yes, I trust you. And every week, whenever you do that, and when you say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, I, I believe that with all my heart. And I trust him. And perfect love casts out fear. So that if something happens on the way home today and I die, if you're a believer, I'll see you later. And that's what we have in Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We become part of him. If you read in John 17 about his high priestly prayer, what is his whole longing that they would be one? And we're going to talk more about that later on. And remember, I used to have a man who I respected said, well, he's inviting you into the honeymoon. No, he isn't. That's only the first part of it. To be one with somebody is to get to know them, to know what they like and what they don't like. Don't do those things. I'm looking at my son and his wife because we, we had some words this week that were kind of fun. We do those things. Husbands, don't you do sometimes something and just to kind of stick it to your wife? I do. <laughs> and and I can I can honestly say now I do it in love. And I'm just looking for that look because I like that look. I see that look come on her face and I go, okay, and I'll go kiss her. All right. It's a lot of fun because when you get to know somebody and now you love them. You want to please them. You want to help them. You want to think alike. That's what it is to be the bride of Christ. And now we're learning. And he has endowed us with the spirit of God. And this is another picture of the husband. He used to send gifts that would make his bride look better to perfect her for whenever they got married, whenever they actually had the wedding ceremony, all right? And Christ gave gifts, right? Anyways, this is part of it. We are the bride of Christ, and he talks explicitly, and if you think it's explicitly here about kisses on the mouth, read the rest of the book and some of them. And for some of you, if you were reading it public, I know for my mom, I saw her turn red. You know, it's talking about an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. That's what it's talking about. And you know what? It's great. And the relationship that we have now with our wives is just a picture, a very start of what's coming of our relationship with Christ the intimacy that we will know him, he's going to reveal himself to us. And our relationship is going to be so close. And that is his desire, his desire that we would be one with him and with his father. If you don't find that incredible, I don't think you're thinking right. All right. We are the bride of Christ, and now he's going to give us a picture here of who this one is. And this is just a small part of the picture. And the one verse I want to hone in on for the start is verse 3. It says, your oil has a pleasing fragrance. It's very pleasant. And remember, in your Bible, it says, your name is like purified. I hope the like is in italics because it doesn't belong there. It's not a simile. Jeff mentioned similes and metaphors. This is not a simile. Your name is poured out oil. All right, I'm going to ask a question. What name is that? Turn 
Turn to Daniel. Turn to Daniel. Daniel 9, verse 25. This is Gabriel talking to Daniel. All right. Daniel 9 is the 77s. All right. And here's just an extra one for you. Some of you I've told this. You know how in the New Testament, the disciples ask the Lord, if my brother sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times? And what's the Lord answer? Yeah. Why is that, Ron? But why that? Is that just a number? You see, I was told that growing up. There is no detail that is extraneous in the Bible. He's telling Jews that because for 490 years, it had been revealed to the Jews. The other, whenever you see that, go looking for another 70 times seven. You're going to find it in Daniel 7 or Daniel 9. I'm sorry, Daniel 9. For the Jews, he says, for the Jews and your people, there's going to be 77s. All right. And that's what it says. It might say weeks in your King James, but it's 77s. It's 77s of years, 490 years. So that when the Lord says, you should forgive him 70 times seven. What does that mean for the Jew? For your whole life. For your whole life. That's how many times you're supposed to forgive. And that also includes you and me. So if you're not Jewish, you still have to forgive. All right. So here we are, Daniel 9.25. So he's speaking about the 77. And he says, so that you know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until... Messiah, the prince, 70 weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with the plaza and a moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. And in the King James, it says, and not for himself. That's a horrible translation. Sounds good. I wish it said that, but it doesn't. Some of them might say, and have nothing. That's real close. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood, even to the end. And there will be war, and desolations are determined. That's all we'll read there. It mentions, with these weeks, the coming of Messiah. And actually, Jeff and I were talking in the car last week. We'd run up to Cave Creek, the four of us, and, uh, and he goes, Mashiach. And he's like, you know, Mashiach. Because the, the letter is one letter in the Hebrew, but the equivalent is a CH. All right. And it's like you're saying with a like you're clearing your throat. All right. And you have that in the Hebrew. All right. But it's Mashiach, and they always say Hamashiach, all right? The Messiah. And the name means anointed. The name that is as oil poured out. That's the name. That's the name he's talking about in Song of Solomon. It's Messiah. Now, here's another question. How many times do you think the word Messiah is trans, when it's translated from the Hebrew to the English, how many times is it mentioned in the Old Testament? We just read them. That's it. That's it. That's the only time it's translated Messiah. All right, specifically, and I think that's for a reason, but that word is used a lot. And it's used primarily for the anointing of, give me one, 
Who did they used to anoint in the Old Testament? The priests. Priests. Who else? Kings. Kings. Is there any else that's mentioned? You can probably guess. <laughs> but I only found one that it actually specifically says he was anointed. And that was Elisha when, he, when Elijah was instructed. Remember, he'd fled. And then the Lord told him, what are you hiding for? Oh, I'm the only one. No, you're not. There's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Get going. Go anoint him as king, Elisha's prophet. And he says, anoint Elisha's prophet. That's the only one I could find in the Old Testament. But there's an anointing, all right? An anointing of the kings and the priests primarily. But a prophet is mentioned at least once. All right. Let's look at one particular one. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 133, Psalm 133, and I, I bet some of you are pretty familiar with this. I, I used to like reading this as a kid because I thought it sounded so funny. But this is part of what I was going to mention with unity. All right, Psalm 133, it's only three verses. Behold how good and pleasant it is, my brothers, to dwell together in unity. It's like precious oil, poured out oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. All right, in real terms, what is this saying about the oil? It's saying they're not sprinkling him. They're dumping it on him. All right. It gets dumped on his head. It runs down on his beard. It runs down on his robes. And how long was the robe? I mean, and make sure you check me on this. It was clear down to his feet. All right, the robes of the priest went clear down to the feet. It didn't matter if you're talking about the purple, blue, and scarlet one or the linen one that he wore on the Day of Atonement. So the oil went from the top of his head right down to his toes. He was doused. New Testament. What John say, John the Baptist? I baptize you with water. There's one coming after me whose shoelaces I'm not even worthy to untie. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've never heard that one comparison, there's two words for baptize. One, but one means to dip. The other one means to immerse. And when it's talking about us, it's talking about the one that's totally immersed. And what it actually does is the example that used is used with pickles and it talks about how there is a actually change chemical change in the pickle whenever it's totally immersed all right in order to pickle it when we are baptized by the holy spirit it's all we're immersed and now what is he talking about here? He's talking about unity. Remember, we talked about that already, right? From John 17 and the picture of the marriage. That now, whenever you have the Messiah, and it's obvious from anyone who cares to want the truth from the Old Testament, that it's talking about Jesus of Nazareth. And he is the Christ. Who do you say that I am? I've, I've told some of you that I, I broke one of my rules on the railroad when I was witnessing to a friend of mine. I always waited till they asked me a question. I couldn't wait for his question. I was so concerned about his salvation. And I asked him, who do you say that Jesus is? And his answer was, I'll let people smarter than me figure that out. And I told him, 
that's what's going to determine your eternal destiny. Who do you say that I am? Somebody tell me, what did Peter answer? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay. You are the Christ. And it is in there, right? And whenever they, remember I said, when they say Hamashiach, the Ha is just the, it, all right? It's, it's not a Messiah, it's the Messiah, all right? Do you remember in John chapter one, Philip goes and gets Nathaniel, right? And he says, what's he tell him? We found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Interesting, isn't it? And look, that's in there for a reason, and we're going to talk about that too. I'm not going to have time. Look. The one that Moses wrote about, it, you'll find it in Deuteronomy 18, right? The Lord is going to send a prophet like me. You must listen to him. Who was the first one who fulfilled that prophet, that prophecy? Who was the first one? We know it was Jesus, but who was the first one? <laughs> who succeeded him? Joshua, right? Kind of interesting, right? Because Yeshua, if you just change the accent, Yeshua, it's the same name, all right? And who was the one who took the people into the promised land? Yeshua, Joshua, all right? Look, the Bible is written for a purpose to point you to Christ, all right? The Lord's going to take us home, and he's coming soon. He's, he's coming for us. And he is our bridegroom and he's coming to get us because this world is getting darker and darker and more evil and more evil. And I, I pray for our children. Amen. You know, we want them to trust Christ. The, the thing that makes me happiest is when Beth teaches the little boys the Bible stories and I see videos of the little boys up in Winslow at Jennifer's grandma's church and they're up there preaching the stories of the bible on the stage because they find out they got a microphone so give them time they'll be up here you know the name the name the messiah all right it's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountain of zion which is Jerusalem, all right? When you say Zion, all right? Zion, it's Jerusalem. That's the mountain that it's on. And we're heading for the heavenly Jerusalem, you and I. That's our home. And I've repeated this before. That's why Jerusalem is plural. The word is plural because there's more than one. There's the earthly Jerusalem. There's the heavenly Jerusalem. All right. We found him the son of Joseph. Do you know that in Judaism, the Jews have two messiahs? They have Messiah ben David, and they have Messiah ben Joseph. All right? I hope this is new to you because it's pretty cool. And they know that the one that they've always talked about is Messiah ben David, the son of David. All right. Remember in the New Testament, when Jesus turns the tables on the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? And the scribes, Messiah, whose son is he? What did they answer right away? Son of David. No, well, they said son of David. He's the son of David. And remember when Bartimaeus, right? The blind guy. How did you know what he really believed? He was yelling at him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Right? What was he acknowledging? That he was the Christ. The Christ who was prophesied. And notice that even Nathaniel, and remember, these were unlearned men. We know that from the scriptures, right? That the disciples were unlearned men. But whenever he calls Nathaniel, 
And Nathaniel comes up and remember, Nathaniel has insulted him basically, it, it, not in his hearing. Can any good come out of Nazareth, right? Because he wasn't from Nazareth, obviously. All right. And he says, come and see. So he's coming up and the Lord says, aha, an Israelite in whom there's no God. This guy will tell it to you straight. All right. How do you know me? Ah, I saw you before Philip even came under the fig tree. What did he say? You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now look, they knew this. Every Jew knew this, that the Messiah was going to be the son of God. And they knew from all the prophecies about the messianic kingdom that was coming, that he was going to sit on the throne of his father, David. They knew this so that the Jews, the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, they didn't want him. But whenever you look at Messiah ben Joseph in Judaism, they know that this is the one who comes before. And he's rejected and he's not a king. In fact, he suffers. He's a servant. And if you follow it all the way through, and I would encourage you, go look at this. You can find it on the internet. You know, make sure you've got good sources. But they knew that he came so that if you just came, I hope it's still on my phone. You can, you can even think about. No, it's not. When, whenever Joseph, the pictures of Joseph, all right? Was it by accident that Joseph was his dad's name? No, all right? His earthly dad, who it wasn't his biological dad, but it was his earthly dad. But they had understood that the Joseph in the Old Testament, the line came from Judah. Should it have come from Joseph? Yeah, I mean, was he the best brother? Was he the one that followed after the Lord the best? Yeah. Judah was a traitor, just like Judah in the New Testament was a traitor. It's the same name, Judas, Judah. It's the same name. He was the one who betrayed him in the Old Testament. Judas betrayed him in the New Testament. The son of Joseph, was Joseph rejected by his brethren? Was he not recognized by them? Did they say, we're not going to have you rule over us? Was he the one beloved by his father? Was he the one incriminated with two other criminals? I had a list of 60 on my phone of Messiah ben Joseph. All right, the things that Joseph had in common with Jesus. And they know that Messiah ben Joseph had to come first, but the Jews won't accept that there had to be such a gap between, but there was. And you know why? I'm looking at the why right now for you and me because he was going to have a Gentile bride, you and me, and he loves us. I've got 15 seconds and I've got way more, but I, I just want to encourage you that the name Messiah, it is as it's, ointment poured forth that's the name and it will transform your life if you go after it all right jesus is the christ the son of the living god he came to seek and to save the lost and he came to seek the sinners the sick, the healthy don't need a doctor. We did. And he saved us because we asked him to. He did everything for us. I can still remember one of the best things I remember about Ray when he used to sit here. I remember the one time he was sitting up here and he goes, well, man, he goes, when you, when you look at salvation, he goes, it's, it's kind of a good deal, isn't it? That's word for word. He goes, it's kind of a good deal. And I, I just had to laugh because I love that. Well, yeah, it is. You do nothing. It is. We have everything to live for. 
And even if we die, we live forever and ever. Let's pray. Our Father, we're just really grateful. Sometimes we wish we had more time, but we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit of God who transforms us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to the day whenever we won't have this flesh, that we will be perfect and that we will be like him because we're going to see him as he is and we're going to reflect his glory. And it's going to be ever increasing glory according to the New Testament. That even boggles our mind. But we know it's true. We thank you for your word. We just pray that uh, this would um, maybe whet the appetites of uh, those here so that they would want to look into these things more and more. We just uh, commit our way and for safe passage home too. In Jesus' name, amen.